I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. Twitter. Twitter is a miracle when watching breaking news. The Boston bombers last week, last Thursday night, watching the pursuit in Boston from Cambridge to Watertown through Twitter, watching the Twitter accounts of people whom you trust, people who have other connections to people they trust, or news services aggregating. Warning, however, Twitter can be very dangerous for the U.S. stock market. A hard-to-believe story, but there it is. A Twitter hoax this afternoon, while the market was open, a little after 1 o'clock East Coast time, and a hack of the Associated Press's Twitter account led to a message going out, and there will be answers about who sent this message, that there had been an attack at the White House, explosions, and that the president was injured within moments because the market trades chiefly on the advice of robots. The market plunged. It recovered quickly enough when AP and Twitter and everyone announced the fact that it had been a hacking. But Twitter is very dangerous. It moves very quickly, and let that be a warning to all of us, including this reporter, that when dealing with Twitter, verify, 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 and then wait 48 hours and verify. The Canadian news is, at this point, a little hard to fathom, although the arrest of two young men, one 35, Jasser, and another 30 years old, Essegar. Essegar is from Tunis. He transferred to Canada. He came into Canada in 2008, and he's a Ph.D. student at an institute in uh, nan bio nanotechnology, a very educated man, young man. He today said they have it all wrong. They misunderstood his remarks. I have it on good authority from a colleague of mine that on his LinkedIn site is the banner of Al Qaeda. In addition, uh, we have reason to believe that he was radicalized or expressing frustration with the Canadian. Uh, people because he was tearing posters from the wall at the institute where he worked and demanded a prayer room of the administration. So, all radicalization signs doesn't mean you're going to be violent or a threat to uh, the nation, but right now the RCMP is saying this young man was part of a plot they've been watching for a year. Jasser is an older part of a plot they've been watching. I come back to the Boston bombers because I'm joined now by... Larry Johnson of No Quarter, writing about the Tsarnaev brothers. What we don't know about the Tsarnaev brothers right now is a room of unexplained coincidences. What we do know about them is that they claim, the family claims, to have Chechen roots. There are five or six families, I'm told, in the whole Boston area with Chechen roots. So this itself is significant in making that statement. This is not a large community like, say, the Armenian community, the, the Assyrian community, my mother's people. This is very small. They all came from the Chechen area following the Civil War in the late 20th century and early 21st century. Larry, a very good evening to you. You have a new post up about the Tsarnaev brothers on No Quarter, what we don't know and what we do. What is most intriguing to your eyes, Larry, having worked at State and at CIA looking at uh, profiles of young men with mysteries in their lives? Good evening to you, Larry. Well, good evening, John. Uh, number one, uh, Tamerlane's mother was the first one in the family to go radical. She did that in 2008. Tamerlan didn't have his conversion experience until 2010 when he was rejected by the United States in a citizenship application and was distraught because he couldn't pursue his, his boxing career. So the next step then, we get 2011. Two things happened that year. We still don't know in what sequence. We know that the Russians contacted the United States government and asked the FBI to check out Tamerlan. We also know that Tamerlan's mother left the United States and went to Dagestan. She was the one who introduced her son, I'm sure, to the radical Islam. Question becomes, did the Russians call us before or after she got to Dagestan? The second thing that's so curious is understanding that the Russians had already tagged this guy as a potential threat, he then goes to Russia, enters the country. Now, I don't know how many of your listeners have ever done that, but the Russians have a very comprehensive, effective computer system. Uh, they're not using paper files, and, and they, they track folks across the country. So how is it that, on the one hand, they're telling us in 2011 this guy's a problem, 
And then mysteriously in 2012, they allow him into the country. He travels to Dagestan and Chechnya. Look right. at the map of the Caspian Sea. Just to the east, the western side of the Caspian Sea is Dagestan. It's extremely mountainous. And then behind Dagestan, uh, embraced by Dagestan and Georgia to the south and autonomous regions to the north, is Chechnya. Right. Dagestan is where the father and mother are living right now, in the capital of Dagestan. And he traveled to there and to Chechnya all all the time traveling in the North Caucasus, that is an extremely watched part of the of Russia uh, ever since the Civil War. So it's very right. difficult to believe that he could travel anonymously. Right. And, and moreover, that is an area that is ripe with Islamic extremists. So uh, given the amount of time he was there, this the, the other thing that came out today was supposedly uh, his younger brother claimed that they, they learned how to build those bombs on the Internet. Uh, no, that I, I, I just having worked with explosives and had, had a week of orient watching what happens after a week of orientation, you get enough information to be dangerous to yourself to blow yourself up. The, the, they showed some level of skill, or he showed a level of skill that week when uh, last week when they planted those bombs. Uh, they he he had to be taught how to build those. And then when he came back to this country in July of... Uh, he was there from January of 2012, to, and he returned in July of 2012. Correct. So since then, he, he's had ample time to collect materials and to build devices. It looks like uh, a source of the explosive was actually large fireworks purchased cross-border in New Hampshire and brought back into Massachusetts. Quite easy to do. But, again, we, don't, we do not understand why the Russians in 2011 are alarmed that this guy is a potential jihadist, and then in 2012 they go mute. I understand how the FBI could have missed the guy, because I've seen over and over and over that they don't really, uh, people even they get put on the terrorism list, they don't go out and routinely question them to try to find out what are their connections, what are their ties. Uh, one final point about the younger brother to underscore his incompetence. Uh, I, I've got from a source who, who knows that he, he shot himself and he tried to commit suicide. He shot himself in the mouth, but he pointed the gun straight back. So it actually penetrated his neck, did not sever or hit the spinal cord. And we could tell because he had powder burns inside his mouth. So here's, a, here's what we're being presented with is a suicidal Islamic terrorist who didn't even know the fundamentals of committing suicide. Larry, right now, because Tamerlan is gone, dead, and we, he can't be interrogated, uh, is there a use to pressing the accusations out of Chechnya? There are accusations out of Dagestan and Chechnya that Tamerlan or that the whole thing was concocted by the FSB. That's what the Chechen nationals and uh, those who are part of the Emirate of the Caucasus, that's the jihadist group in the whole area, are saying that this is an FSB plot to call to to uh, to enlist the Americans in making war on us, where we're we're making war on Russia. We don't have anything to do with America. Sure, sure. I mention that only, Larry, because we know that there are still doubts about the 1999 apartment bombing in, in Moscow that started the war, the Dagestan War, the second part of the civil war in Chechnya. Right. The FSB is along been identified as a possible, uh, possible possible culprit in that operation in Moscow to inflame the Russian people and launch the second war. Yeah, if an act of terrorism is, is intended to advance someone's cause, this attack in the Boston Marathon did nothing to advance the cause of the Chechen rebels. So the but Chechen it did get a call Chechen. from Putin to Obama. It, but did, it did do that. Actually, yeah, there's a raw rapprochement between uh, Moscow and Washington on that front, and further renewed focus that no longer is there going to be the sympathy inside the United States for, for towards Chechen refugees or people claiming political asylum. So it's one possibility that has to be looked at. We can't also deny the possibility that maybe the Russians were trying to use him in some aspects, but that Tamerlan on his own had his own personal vendetta going back to his anger over not getting the visa. But he was equipped and enabled uh, by Islamists. But it is, uh, uh, you know, we're a long way from the truth on this. And if you got to watch any of Janet Napolitano today, uh, she she looked like Nadia Comaneci in the Olympics doing some of the backflips she did, contradicting previous positions with respect to what the FBI knew, didn't know, and when they knew it. 
Larry Johnson, writing most recently in No Quarter, uh, the unanswered questions, the speculations, the accusations flying from the North Caucasus to Washington, and then from Washington to across the table in Washington. That's how Washington works these days. Perhaps Janet Napolitano can blame sequestration for not having the facts correct. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show.